I want to really uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart um, for coming here um, today. There are some really amazing talks, and um, probably if I wasn't here, I'd probably be somewhere else uh, watching one of those amazing talks. So you chose me, and I appreciate that. So uh, I'm going to get started right away. Let's see if I can see this, though. Since the fifth grade, Brian Russell Davis has been solving his problems with computer code. His Sacramento software company, Axiom 88, solves problems for the military and business. But the code that inhabits his heart and mind lately is named JL. Hello, I am JLAI. I can help you find a safe place, get someone to talk to or alert the police. So this is a chatbot. Um, an AI chatbot. Basically what it does is it um, detects responses and uh, input from the user and it is smart enough to give back an intelligent response. JL is built to help women escape their abusers. It's cloud-based. There's no app to download. It's accessed through a phone number and available on anything that sends digital messages. It can be on Facebook Messenger, it can be on Skype, it can be on Alexa anything that has kind of like a messaging component to it. Okay, could you please provide your name and location so that we can send help your way? Brian gave her a voice for us, but JL can be discreet, silently guiding her charges to safety. For me, for someone who has a moment, you know, maybe, maybe the abuser's in the other room, maybe the abuser, you know, went out, um, went out for an errand or, you know, whatever, but um, they just have a little bit of time. Programmers have the software ready to launch, but Brian needs local domestic violence experts to help him teach JL. I mean, I would naively ask you, is it hard? Is it hard to create an app that's smart enough to help? You know, uh, I think it's hard because you have to engage so many people to be a part of the process. And that's what I'm hoping to do is to, to get the collaboration of the community. That part is hard. The coding part is not hard. That's what we do. So a text in the night from a desperate woman or man could soon be answered by artificial intelligence built to have the answers, to provide the help, and to quickly save lives. It's us. So it's going to do what we need it to do. And it's the collective, it's our collective thoughts and experiences um, being put to good use. So who is JL? JL is my daughter's middle name, <laughs> but it's also um, the name of a uh, character in the Bible. And she's a woman, a very strong woman, that confronted the enemy and, and confronted them by herself. And she was very brave, so. Right. So um, I'm gonna start this off a little different and um, uh, because I get this great sense of coming um, to this place, coming to uh, Missouri, uh, that uh, there's a lot of history here. And um, even when I was uh, traveling across the cobblestone roads, and some of the roads are exposed, I can see the cobblestone, and what was conjured in my mind is like all these images from the past. And, and, and there's certain traditions where we, we uh, think it's very important and sacred to, uh, to acknowledge the ancestors uh, those who came before us, and, and for us to ask permission, uh, because their blood has spilled on this ground, um, that they ask permission to uh, give us the chance to speak and that our words will be acceptable to them. So I do ask that. And even if you don't um, count it sacred, then, then, then you know that the history of this place uh, is very complicated, and um, there's lots that have gone on here. And uh, Michael Brown isn't the only one that has fallen. And uh, there have been other brown boys sitting on their knees with their eyes shut, hands behind their heads, fingers woven, pinkies up, saying he didn't even do nothing what you want. They threw him on the ground when he, and called them all punks. Retro blue and white Jordans, tongues out over the black jeans, cuffed just the right amount to make them bunch around the cash just the way he likes. Just ran out of boxer briefs so he was wearing tidy whities with the white t-shirt and the breeze catch it just so, pressing tight against his chest but so the red hole is getting wider and the blood is soaking into the fabric and pooling on the ground so he looks down automatic and the dark pavement gets darker when it's wet and he's losing his balance slow with his hands on his head. So his face hits first and his eyes go dead 
and the air sucked out of the world with his last breath. Times have made a choice of what to keep and what to throw away. Everything in grain comes to a point so sharp you could cut a piece of day and it bleeds on the ground. Keep your knees on the ground where they belong. Keep your knees on the ground where they belong. That was a piece that, what, that David, David Diggs uh, 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 recited and, and performed at the Brown Baccalaureate this year. And when I watched that on YouTube, I was like, man, I got to go to Brown. <laughs> I just love the, the intertwining of the humanities and all the things that it means to us. And um, I have signed up for Brown, actually. Um, I'm going to be doing a, a master's degree in uh, cybersecurity. And so that kind of brings me to the beginning of who am I? Insert impressive credentials here. <laughs> so I'm a software engineer. Um, I'm also a graduate of uh, Morehouse College. I've been a software engineer for about 20 years. Um, I was very, very uh, um, blessed and honored to have worked at Pandora um, for uh, for five years um, before the Republic and uh, was one of the principal engineers working on what we call digital engagement. So basically, I was the jerk that was making it possible for all the ads to pop up. <laughs> but um, um, what, what, I, we, what we liked to do at Pandora was to make the ads very engaging, to make it a part of the process of listening to music. So this idea of like machine learning and data science and, and, and that being integrated into our user experience, like, I had no idea what the word data science meant when I was working at Pandora, but that's exactly what we were doing. And so um, um, it's very, very important to me that, that um, not only am I um, taking my experiences and my education and putting it to good use, like the speaker said uh, yesterday, but that it's also impacting lives. So that kind of goes to my next uh, point of who am I. I am a survivor of domestic violence. So I know it's very rare, and you might look at me like, ah, oh, so that big guy, you know what I'm saying, got the dreadlocks, everything, you know what I'm saying, how could, how could he be afraid of anyone? And, and fear is a thing that has no color and no size, no, no any of that. I mean, and also it has no gender, even though more women are affected by domestic violence than anyone on the planet. So being a survivor of it, I understand what, it, what goes on. And I understand this idea that there's a cascading failure that can happen in your life where, you know, you find yourself in a place and you don't really know how you got there. And you don't really know how, you, how your choices contributed to the fact that you're in this spot right now. And, but you also blame yourself for all the things that happened to you. Uh, you know, there were several times that I would be kneeling in, a, in my bathroom um, saying the most powerful prayer that I, that I knew um, just trying to pass the time over when the yelling would stop. And I would kneel there and I would say, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the foul clips of circumstance, I have not winched nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody yet unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And I would just keep on saying it over and over again until the yelling would stop. And, and, then, and then I would venture out and, and then think about all the things that happened up until this point. And even, even years later, after, after I escaped that, that very, very bad situation, then that same person would force their way into my house and, and, uh, and threaten me to my face in front of my children. And, uh, and I called the police, but they didn't come. And uh, then I tried to get the 911 tape, but it was erased. You see, see my ex is, uh, was an assistant DA. <laughs> so it definitely knows no boundaries, any of it, all of the violence. And uh, we have to find a way to stop it. So, this is my talk, welcome. Sorry for the really dramatic intro. <laughs> um, so I want to do one correction here, and uh, I want to say that, because uh, I went to another talk. <laughs> and so we're going to call this Machine Intelligence for Victims of Domestic Violence. Right. Um, so what is JLAI? So we went over this really quickly with the, with the video. 
Um, it's a real-time decision-making engine that uses a natural language process to understand inputs and to route survivors to resources based on their situation. So um, just really simply, you know, someone is in a situation and they need to get out and they can text to the service and try to find that. And so what I did uh, was um, use uh, a really simple natural language processing kind of like intent engine um, uh, um, API data AI. Um, and then I got a whole bunch of uh, uh, hotline scripts. So these are domestic violence hotline scripts that have been curated and kind of like, um, you know, in use by people who understand domestic violence from a psychological uh, perspective, people who are advocates, um, people who, who are survivors of domestic violence, and using this kind of like, um, this, this, um, all of this information to create these intents. Um, so, you know, maybe you are messaging to JL, and JL, uh, you're saying, hey, I need some help. Or maybe you're saying, you know, hey, I need someone to talk to. And so basically what it's doing is just trying to respond to you every single one of those needs. And it's going to get smarter and, and better. I'm going to show you some other ways that it gets a lot smarter in a second. So question is, <clears throat> why are we doing this? Well, domestic violence is very bad. And domestic violence is spreading. Um, it's alarming the amount that it's spreading. The, the next, the, I'm not going to kind of inundate you with a lot of statistics, because I think it's out there. You can find it if you want to know about it. And this talk is not necessarily about all the statistics that are going on, but about how we're using technology to stop it. But this, this statistic right here, the 65% um, the of women killed because of DV are murdered at the moment they try and leave, that was 50% when I started um, um, doing this research. So it's got, and then, then another study came out, and, and it's higher. So what, what does that mean? It's like at that moment that they say that they're going to leave, and it could be an hour, it can be, it could be 30 minutes, it can be you know, a week or whatever, they, you have a 65% chance of getting murdered in that moment. 65%. So when I saw that, and also the, second, also the last point right here where it says it's the third leading cause of homelessness. So if you, don't, if you do survive and get out, okay, then, then you'd probably be homeless, like on the street. So, you remember when I talked about that cascading failure? And we understand that um, in terms of um, technology. You know, if you look at a network, you can understand what cascading failure means. Um, and if you look at biology, you can, understanding, you can understand what cascading failure means. If you look at um, structural um, um, engineering, you can understand what cascading failure means. It's this idea that one failure leads to another and that it weakens the structure so much that the whole thing can fall apart. And this is what's happening in people's lives when they're living in situations where the person that they love and the person that they've put their trust in is basically trying to kill them. And um, yeah, so this is, this is the reason why we're doing it. I'm going to skip this um, for a second. I'm going to go to this video real quick, and I'm going to play this. I want, you to, I want you to watch it carefully, and I want you to tell me when she's in danger.
was she in danger? Anyone have an idea? Right. Right. The moment she met him, she was in danger. It's not, not when, you know, <laughs> uh, she got mad or he got mad or anything like that. The moment that she met him, she was in danger. Yeah. So this is why we have to understand at a deeper level what this means. Because, because this is happening, this affects people individually, but it also affects families. Okay, um, as a survivor, uh, one of the things that my ex did to hurt me uh, way after the fact is when I, got, when I was able to get away from her, then she decided to brainwash my child. My child was, uh, at the time, 14. She's now going to be a sophomore in uh, college uh, pretty soon, and um, I haven't talked to her since then. And I have two boys as well, that weren't affected by it. So, but she was able to get to my daughter and she was able to brainwash her into thinking that I was doing something to her. <laughs> when she was the one that was like breaking down doors and taking it off the hinges and yelling and screaming and threatening, you know, waking me up in the middle of the night, talking over me, writing journals, you know, saying that she would, you know, that she would kill me, all of this stuff. So, <clears throat> it, it has a cascading, once again, the cascading effect that it has on your life is, is, uh, is tremendous. So, the reason why I want to bring up that cascading effect, right, is because if I was to tell you or any of you guys, you know, like software engineers or network engineers, that, you know, that you had to fortify a system, right, that had the, the vulnerability to cascading failure, what would you do? What would you do? Any ideas? Isolate. Isolate? Isolate what? Right, right, right. So, 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 it, so if, you, if you know that this is a point that's going to fail, <coughs> you can say, okay, I know this is going to fail, so I'm going to have a backup for this. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of like an idea of a load balancer. What else? That's a kind of hard, abstract question. Being preemptive, right, right. So, so you know that this, so, so when something fails, then <clears throat> you know that, you know, you have a backup, but, but being preemptive and trying to kind of stay away from the failures, that's another thing. Okay, I won't press you guys too much because I can tell, you know, it's a hard question. But <clears throat> this, is, this is the frustration that's happening right now in the DV community. It's this idea that, and my, my, inter, my interfacing with them is that, is that we have these ways of dealing with DV, but they're, you know, they're very antiquated, okay? Um, um, this problem is not, this problem is very old, and, but the solutions are very new. So, you know, if you know anything about, you know, um, women's history, and um, <clears throat> I've been studying it more and more because I'm, um, I, I'm this, also the CTO of the Women's Global Leadership Initiative. Um, temporarily, because I, I need to find a woman to take my place <laughs> very, very, very dearly. Um, but <clears throat> when you understand women's history, then you understand that this is something that didn't just start yesterday and has a very, very long history. And I was, you know, in my research, I was very, very curious. I was like, when did this start? Like, was there a time that women actually had equal rights and, and were seen as, um, as equals? With, um, with men, and because and, it seems the further back you go in history, the worse and worse it gets. You know, you go back to the 70s, and you know, they had to ask their, you know, their, their, their husbands to get permission to get a credit card, and you go back to, you know, um, kind of like the 1800s and, 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 and somewhere around there when, when men would actually come to court and be like, well, she's my wife, I have the right to beat her, you know, that kind of thing. And that didn't end, you know, and it wasn't really until the 90s that people were really, like, getting arrested for it. That's just crazy. So it, was, it became illegal, like, I think in 1851, somewhere around there. And then it wasn't until the 1990s that we began to see people actually get in trouble for it. <laughs> it's, just, it's just completely crazy. So I, I went further and further and further, further back to realize that, that it was in ancient Greece when there were some cities where women had, were seen as equals and some cities where they were not. And it was all about the ideas that were being propagated at the time. And the ideas and I really, really hate this because I'm a philosophy major and I really loved Aristotle, but Aristotle is one of the people that said, hey, women are not, women are, women are not 
equals. Women should be kept in the house, and women shouldn't have any rights. We should, they should be kept away from everyone. And, and a lot of it's really complex and has to do with like sexual freedom, that kind of thing, and lineages and that kind of thing. But then I went further back into ancient Egypt. And in ancient Egypt, they did actually have equality. And there were high priestesses and landowners and people that had, you know, you know equality. And I'm not an Egyptologist or anything like that, so um, you could probably check me on that. But, um, yeah, so, so the reason that we're, we're, we're tackling a very, very old problem, okay? We're unwinding something that's very, very, very ancient. And so when we're doing that, this whole idea of being preemptive and, and responding to failure in systems, okay, is very, very important. And this is why not only in the DV community, but in all kind of like nonprofits, we need to start using technology because the technology, what it's designed to do is to do both of those things, to be a backup plan, okay, when something fails, and to be preemptive when something is okay. And so, yeah, uh, JL is not going to replace a real-life person talking on the phone, trying to guide someone through a process. But it's another thing, another avenue, another way to stop that domino effect, to be preemptive or to, to respond when something has completely failed. Uh, so here are some of the other things that we're doing. <clears throat> Predictive situational awareness and scenario curation. So I told you I worked for Pandora. And I think that, you know, working there and this whole idea of curation is like really kind of like embedded inside of me now. Um, it's this idea that we're going to start, uh, um, you know, ingesting all this information from um, 911 calls and um, all, of the, all of the hotline calls and all of the, all the times that women talk to these, um, um, these services and try to start deconstructing like, like the way that things happen, the way that things fall out. So we begin to know and understand what to look for and how to respond to those things. And, and, and in the situations where people survived, what was the difference? What was the action that was taken? Now, the reason why no one wants to touch this with the 10-foot pole is because it has legal liability written all over it, <laughs> okay? No one wants to be responsible for the fact that if AI says something or fails or has a crash and then, you know, someone dies, then what? Then they're going to sue JLAI. Okay. I'm not afraid of that because for me, that is basically being, um, being, being uh, frozen by inaction because of, of, of fear of failure. And we don't live any of our life like that in any, in any other facet because we would just be stuck in our house and not move. Okay. So we have to find a way around that. We're going to find a way through it. Um, and to be able, and I think this is a good idea is that once we curate all of those, all of those calls and all of those hotline scripts, okay, um, we're going to be better than even in some instances. I mean, I mean, the same mistakes could happen with a person, okay? If a hotline um, person comes in and is not in a good mood or, you know, they can spill coffee on themselves, like anything can happen, right? So that, that could cause that same failure. So the idea here is that we're going to take all of that knowledge and put it at the fingertips of JL. And this is what, you know, machine learning and AI and uh, natural language processing is good for. Um, <clears throat> so what are our challenges? What are our, what are our needs? Uh, we need money. <laughs> um, right now, um, I've worked on this so much that I've kind of neglected all the other parts of my business. Uh, I've basically, um, you know, I don't have any clients right now uh, as far as you know, my, in my dev shop that I, that I run. And uh, I've been working on this 24-7. Um, it's really, really important um, that we get some funding so that we can take care of the other two things up there. <clears throat> um, we need a lawyer <laughs> or two. <laughs> Excuse me? Are you on Kickstarter? No, we're not. No, we're not. No, I, I haven't put on Kickstarter because I feel like what we need to do is we need to f form a, you know, a 501c3, and there's lots of kind of like just logistical, logistical work that needs to be done. Um, the other thing is that uh, um, I know what it's like to build something completely by yourself, and I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> um, all the successful startups that I see and businesses and that kind of thing, they have at least two people, you know, people that are kind of holding each other accountable and like working together. Um, so that's the other thing is we need partnerships um, and uh, we need engineers. 
Um, and we need money. <laughs> I say that again. So, you know, this, this idea of, of, of using AI, this idea of using, and, this, and the AI is not, you know, it's not like, it can't, you know, it can't be like Siri. It can't be like, oh, you know, I didn't understand what you meant. You know, okay, it has to 90%, 99% of the time understand what's going on. And if it really doesn't understand, then what I want to do is also build into the um, system where, you know, if conversation's going on and obviously is having problems, then, you know, for a DV counselor to step into the conversation so that, you know, but you know, think of all the DV counselors that we would need on staff in a call center or somewhere, like working like 24 7, like it would be a massive, massive amount of people. So um, my, my, my goal right now is to, um, is, to, is to make sure that it keeps on running without the need for a human being. Um, <clears throat> I've, uh, I've written a little kind of like sneaky Python script that is um, um, constantly like scraping the web for um, uh, resources and it's putting all the information in the database. So it's like, you know, this is the DV um, um, resource, this is the location, where we can go here, the hours, this is the name of it, this is the address, this is the telephone number, this is the website, this is who you contact. And it's very, very complex actually the, the way the whole entire thing works because you just can't put anybody in every DV center, okay? There's some DV centers that handle children, some that don't, some that handle pets. Like, imagine, like, having to make the choice of whether to, you know, stay and possibly get killed or, like, leave your dog, you know? It's a very, very hard thing. Uh, if you don't have any resources, if, if you don't really know what's going to happen to your pet, that person might kill your pet. You know, people, you know, people are evil. So um, it's one of those things where, where it's, it's more complex than just kind of, like, um, asking someone to go to a website. Okay, and a lot of people don't have the guts to get on the phone because, you know, I didn't have the guts to get on the phone. Um, I didn't have the guts to tell anyone. This is actually the first time ever that I've spoken publicly about it like this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, so we want to, so what, so what I'm doing here is just creating another avenue for people to be able to, to speak out. Um, I'm right at the time limit, I think, or somewhere near there, and uh, I want to definitely leave time for a discussion because um, I think that it's important for me, at least, um, to kind of hear back. Um, and it, it could be comments, ideas, questions. Like, go ahead, like, open it up. Go ahead. Where do I get that list? You said, where do I get that list? Right, right. So the question was, where does the list of possible recommendations come from that um, JL can, um, can undertake? And that comes from uh, the hotline um, scripts. So uh, the, every person that goes through hotline training has to train for every type of scenario. Um, so that's where it comes from initially. And then also um, that list is curated by a DV advocate or DV psychologist. So this is someone, so, you know, I've, um, I think that's a really important part because there's a lot of, there's some people that are trying to do AI for like therapy for like teenagers. And I was listening to um, uh, one of the um, NPR specials about it and the, it was, it kind of failed pretty hard because the first thing that um, the DV psychologist said to the AI was, I hate my mom. And the AI was like, I don't understand. I was like, it's like, that's the first thing that a child sometimes is having problems would say to, you know, um, uh, an AI. So that's, that's one of the things that's really important to me is to make sure that as many intents as I can, I, as I can think of are added to the system. That's where machine learning comes in so that as it gets kind of like this uh, um, alpha use or beta use that, um, that, it's, that, you know, it's being used by survivors, that when it gets into production, it's going to be as prepared as possible. So it's not in production because I don't have any of these things. I, the first thing I said is I need a lawyer. But people, but um, I kid you not, like the minute before I had a prototype, um, um, Christina Mondanza um, was trying to contact me for an interview. I had to scramble to get my prototype done. And when I finished the prototype, then people 
and they saw the news story, and then people started trying to use it, and I had to shut it down because it's not ready yet. Um, so, yeah, I, there's people clamoring to use it, and then people started asking me for help, which is heartbreaking, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I was responding in the best way I knew how, and um, then all of my friends, so many friends that came out of the woodwork saying, you know, that they had been, um, you know, abused, and, and there were survivors I, I didn't even know. You know, so, yeah, it's not a production yet, but we, we need to get it there fast. Right, yeah. This is the hard part. So the hard part is that I think my sense is that in the beginning, it'll be really, really hard for JL to do any kind of like therapy, okay? It's really meant in the beginning, my idea is just to help people get out, okay, and find resources. Once it detects like a conversation that seems to be like, okay, you know, kind of how do I deal with the situation and it's, it's in the detail of like therapy that it needs to like refer them to get help because it's not going to be able to replace that counseling um, element. Uh, so, yeah, that's something that, that definitely we'll have to detect. And it, it, what it's really trying to do is figure out how imminent the danger is, because it, it, it generally is very imminent if they're trying to find a way to escape. It's pretty bad then. For sure. Right, right. So that, that's a very good point, and this is the reason why I, I, I chose to set up um, through text messaging. I know that iCloud, you know, is going to kind of screw with that, um, but it's, it's even more, it's the easiest thing that you can, that you can delete and, um, and then not have to worry about reinstalling it or putting it on again and then and then once you start texting again and so this is a this is another benefit of having uh, an AI doing doing the work is that if you called into a DV center and you got someone on the phone and you're talking with them then you had to hang up okay because your abuser came back and then you know you had to call back in again who knows if you're gonna get that same person who knows if the person that you're gonna get is gonna remember you know all of what happened if they're taking notes or not or recording the call or who knows so with JL they can pick the conversation right back up after they delete it like nothing ever happened um, the iCloud challenge uh, is gonna be hard um, but and people do destroy devices that's, that's a very common thing that happens in domestic violence is that's the first thing that gets destroyed is a device um, as I said it's not a silver bullet but it's it's an avenue so we'll have to work around those challenges I think that would be hard. I think that I think it's possible for, for someone to um, refer refer JL to someone else, um, and uh, I think that you know it, it's an interesting question to, to you know if you're not ready for help and someone comes and you know intervenes you know how do you respond to that? You know it's, people will respond differently. So I don't think creating any hard fast rule of like yes or no would be appropriate. Like for me at least. Uh, it, 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 it takes a lot of thought and, um, unfortunately, some risk taking. Way, way in the back. Um, sure. Right. <laughs> um, if you want to donate, um, we do have a we do have a, a, a website that has Donately on there, you know. And I'm definitely not gonna, you know, I don't want to like put a pressure on you guys to like you know donate, you know, whatever. But if if you want to, it's jl.ai, and you'll find it uh, the link to donate there. Um, <clears throat> we're training right now. God, what's happening? Um, we're training right now with uh, survivors and um, the hotline scripts. So it's not live. Um, 
in, in the sense that it's open to the whole entire world, but it's available to us so that we can, and these are just survivors that people, I just know as friends and that kind of thing. So, um, and me and myself as a, as a survivor, so it's, it's not a, a, a very formal process, but um, it's something that was going on um, for a while, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll have a list of, uh, I'll list out a conversation, and then I'll give it to someone and say, what does this look like? And it's like, oh, you forgot about this. Like, what if that, blah, blah, blah. And these are people who are trained to understand DV, like, you know, scenarios. Once jail helps the victim get a resource, would it be possible to have the resource to then have access to the conversation so that the victim doesn't have to rehash everything? Like a counselor could look it up and say, oh, this is right. Right. So this is actually very important, and this is, this is why we need a lawyer and the partnerships, because there's lots of privacy concerns there. Um, you know, they have to give, they have to give um, permission for that conversation to be shared, just like anything else. And, um, but if, you know, and I really don't want to start off a conversation <laughs> with um, a disclaimer, like, you're, you're, you're giving JL the right to, to, you know, to give this, you know, and that would be, that would kind of kill the vibe right there. Um, um, I want to be able to, um, to do this in a way that makes sense. Uh, and this is one of the reasons, again, that I'm, I'm uh, you know, for me, cybersecurity is a human right. And um, the Brown uh, program um, that I'm enrolling in is, uh, is all about not just about the technology, but also about policy. So it's very important. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, have you open sourced the code It will be open source, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I need an organization in order to kind of like do that with. Go ahead. Way in the back. Yeah, so um, part, of, part of the impressive um, credential stuff that I didn't mention is that um, uh, a lot of the work that I've done um, after Pandora uh, has been for the uh, US, military, US military intelligence. Um, and um, I've, uh, I've designed systems that, um, you know, everyone, uh, everyone knows about the whole, like, you know, PRISM thing and all that stuff and digesting all of the information. And, um, so basically what I... I didn't do that work, <laughs> but um, what I did is uh, develop um, systems for agencies to uh, create analytical tools and then share those analytical tools across um, agencies. And it's called the BDP, it's called um, Big Data Platform. Um, so you can look that up. But it, but um, but yeah. So I've worked with a lot of the machine learning stuff for for stuff that's. Uh, it seems to me like a, it's a zillion times harder to analyze. Um, than this, and then uh, I also worked on something uh, called, called Archangel, and that's a pretty interesting tool because if you ever watched like, you know, Jason Bourne or The Bourne Identity or something like that, and you see that screen that they have with like, you know, the map of you know some city, and they're like zooming in and like plugging in the cameras, like that software is pretty much real, yeah. <laughs> and um, and I helped build it, and it, it basically what it does is it is it ingests all this information. And then it can actually do more than what you see on TV. It's like, it's like literally like um, a Google map for like threats. And so what it's doing is it's trying to figure out like, okay, if you go from here to here, what's your chances of being attacked? And then you can scroll the scrub bar back. So, and like go, go back in time, go forward in time and all of this stuff. And it's just ingesting huge amounts of data from like, you know, like social media and agencies and all this other stuff like that. So. Right, so um, when, when this aired, well, before this aired, I was trying to get a hold of, a, of an organization in Sacramento called Weave. And um, they're like, kind of like the top dog in the sense of like, you know, helping women and just being you know, there for women. And they got a lot of funding from, from everywhere. And uh, they, were, they wouldn't return any of my phone calls or um, uh, emails. And then um, um, I asked Christina to you know, advocate for me with them, and then I finally got them in a room, and um, they listened to me, and then, you know, kind of like the tech phobia came up, 
of like, you know, is this going to replace this? And I tried to you know, explain to them in the most empathetic, empathetic way I, I knew how, but it just I didn't get, you know, they never followed up. So organizations like that is what we need on board, but I'll be happy with anyone, like an individual from that organization or just a person that's done it in the past. But those partnerships with those types of organizations that get a lot of money from uh, the federal government, from private organizations, those are going to be the ones that are going to help us because they have already fought the fight with like police and um, all of the agencies around protecting women's information and protecting women's rights. So they're going to be the best people to, to be on our team. Uh, go ahead. Making a what? I'm sorry. A Snapchat version? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think we can be creative around that. Um, as I said, I'm not going to close any door. I think, as I said about the whole cascading failure thing, the, mo the more places that you can use as a backup, um, as long uh, as we don't put people in more danger, and 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 we don't know. You know, we have to we have to test this out, but. I think that uh, I wouldn't rule it completely out, but I'll be very careful with it. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, and uh, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this. And uh, um, if you have any questions, I'm here. I'm on the Slack channel. Thank you very much.